Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. And we're going to read it in unison, please. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. In that, that while we were still sinners, Christ, Christ died, died for us. For this, this is God's word, word and this, this is what, what I believe. believe. Oh, I really like that verse. I'm so thankful God did not wait for me to do something good because I am less. I can't do good. I'm less. Of everybody else, I think. Oh, so... Um, I'd rather have Jesus at our next song, number 454. You know, I hope you'd rather have Jesus than anything else. Better than even America. I mean, I like America, I do, but Jesus is far more important. Same with money, with a job, with a car, with a beautiful wife, or a husband. <laughs> it's, it's, I just thank the Lord that you Jesus Christ is who he is. So let's turn to number 454. I'd rather have Jesus. Let's stand together. We'll sing these three words. We've got to wait one second for the words to come up. Otherwise, you may have to turn your books. You're not quick. advancing uh, less. Oh, there it is. There it goes. Okay, here we go. So, ready? Here we go. Yeah. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by His name. Than to be the king of a vast domain, or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything that this world affords. Today. Okay, let's let's turn your hymnals to 454. So grab your hymnal, 454, because uh, we don't know when the words gonna show up, but this way we have it. <laughs> so 454. By the way, you guys, I feel sorry for Dion. Tell Dion he does a great job no matter what happens back there. Technology, he does a great job. Thank you, Dion. Thank you, Dion. Appreciate all that you do. Okay, you guys got it? In your song books, 454, we'll start with number two. Here we go. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world Jesus. 
of your heart, you may be seated. Say, when that computer doesn't uh, cooperate with us and you see me run back there, it's not, don't ever think it's because I think I can fix it. Because there ain't no way I can fix it. I'm just back there to say, hey, we got a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's what that's about. Yeah. I'd like to have you open your Bibles to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2. And by the way, Wendy is with us as a guest this morning. And she has a Bible she was given her here on February 9th, 19, was it 86? 86. So she still has the Bible she was given as a little girl. Yeah. I imagine you're only one at the time, probably, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question. Can you remember back to a time when your books had many pictures and only a few words? That's going way back, right? That's going way back. Maybe a more recent memory is that of leafing through a picture book with a small child seated on your lap. You know, as you gazed at the picture of a cow, you said, what animal is this? And the child said, a cow. And then you said, and what does the cow say? And the child said, moo. Well, eventually... That child will grow and learn to identify a cow by the letters C-O-W and that it belongs to the family of animals called bovines. But for the time being, the child associates the animal with its pictures and the sound that it makes. Now, books we now read as adults are not like those that children enjoy. Our, our, our reading material has many words and few pictures, if any at all. Because as we mature and our vocabulary develops, our ability to communicate depends far less on pictures and far more on words that those pictures represent. And you know, there is a parallel to that scenario in the way that God has, has listened, communicated his truth to mankind. Much of the Old Testament is a picture book. In fact, it's been described that way. It's a picture book. I heard R.C. Sproul, great preacher, say, I don't think I would understand or believe the New Testament were it not for the pictures in the Old Testament. That's a big statement, big statement. So the Old Testament is a picture book that illustrates the truths of God. And the pictures appear in the form of colorful people, dramatic events, and items which represent God's truth symbolically. Whenever we speak of a type in the Bible, we're referring to the prefiguring of a person or an idea in picture form. The antitype is the reality that the type represents. Now, as time passed and as more revelation was given by God, the Old Testament pictures were gradually replaced by revelation in more adult terms, those seeking God had grown to understand. Now, let me give you a few examples that will help you grasp what I'm talking about. First of all, the animal skins that were provided by God to cover the sin and the guilt of Adam and Eve, they were a picture of what atonement is. To atone means to cover, to cover. And through the sacrifice of innocent animals, the guilt of man's sin was covered and was put out of God's view. And so that's what the animal skins represented. Noah's Ark paints a picture of God's means of salvation. The design for the ark was entirely the product of God. God told Noah specifically how to build it how long to make it, how wide to make it. And when Noah and his family entered the ark, God shut the door and, listen, they were safe inside when the rains fell and the floods rose. You know, in the very same way, God has designed his salvation plan, and those who are in Christ are safe in God's ark of salvation today. Amen? 
Jonah, the prophet of God, was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish. And then he was burped on shore. Now, that's a pretty graphic picture, isn't it? Matthew 12, 40, the New Testament explains that Jonah inside the great fish is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus that took place about 800 years later. After three days and three nights, Jesus walked out of the tomb alive. Now, these are just a few, just a few examples of the many Old Testament pictures that represent God's truth. Some pictures are more obvious than others, and in some cases, we're told exactly what the picture represents. Now, the story of Ruth, with all of its movement and emotion and color, presents a picture of something. It presents a picture of redemption, of redemption. According to chapter 1 and verse 1, the setting for the story was the time of the judges. It was in the midst of that 350-year period of spiritual unfaithfulness and political anarchy that this drama took place. Elimelech is a picture of Israel's unfaithfulness during those years. And his family was a microcosm of the nation and a type of all who once knew God yet moved away from him. And through his disobedience, Elimelech's family came under the chastening of God. Chapter 1 concludes with the repentance and the return of Naomi and her daughter-in-law Ruth. And this is what God requires of anyone who wanders away from him. He causes them to repent. Now chapter 2 then proceeds to tell the story of the restoration of these two women to the place of blessing. And the story is a beautiful picture of the grace and the mercy of God. The God who anxiously, eagerly waits to forgive and restore and bless the sinner who comes home. Now the conversion of Ruth the Moabitess also portrays God's willingness to save Gentiles. And that's every one of us, to the best of my knowledge, right? Let's say amen. We are a bunch of Gentiles here this morning. Converted to faith in the God of Israel, Ruth was brought into the covenant of blessing that originally belonged only to the descendants of Abraham. And, and so here we have a picture of the great doctrinal reality that's set forth in Romans chapter 9 to 11, Ephesians chapter 2. And that doctrinal reality is this. We, as Gentiles who were once aliens and outside of God's promises, we who are without God and without hope in the world, have been included by the grace of God that was revealed in Christ. And once again, God's people said, Amen. Thank you, Lord. Now, with that introduction, this morning, I want to examine a few other pictures contained in this beautiful story. In particular, I want to focus on the romance of Ruth while paying special attention to the grace and the love of Boaz. Well, first of all, we have the recognition of love, and I'm going to read chapter 2, verse 18 to 22. Then she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, and so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today, and where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked, and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relation of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young women, and that people do not meet you in any other field. Well, last Sunday... We, we found the gracious favor bestowed upon Ruth as she gleaned in the fields of Boaz. 
And Boaz approached Ruth and he spoke kindly to her. He encouraged her to remain in his field. He ordered the young men to leave her alone. He invited her to drink freely from the water that he had provided for his workers. And he welcomed her to join them in the lunchroom. <clears throat> As a special favor, Ruth was allowed to glean among the hired hands that uh, a Boaz and Boaz instructed his workers to drop some sheaves of barley on purpose for Ruth to pick up. Now, now when the day was over and Ruth threshed the barley, uh, she, she returned to Naomi carrying an ephah of barley. Now, an ephah was equivalent to about 30 pounds or a half a bushel of barley. I, I looked it up at today's prices. That would be worth about $18.30. Now, all of this happened by divine arrangement. God was, was working out his plan for the widow Naomi and for her daughter-in-law Ruth. Their needs were supplied as God's plan for their future was unfolding. Now, before we, we move on to the next verses, we need to pause to ask a few questions about Boaz. Who is this guy? Well, I would suggest that Boaz was the most eligible bachelor in Bethlehem. No, he, he was a bachelor because he, he, he was, we don't know why. We don't know why. Did I catch you there? Was he socially backward? Was he, for some reason, undesirable? I don't think so. According to chapter 2 and verse 1, he was a man of great wealth. And, and we can see that he was well respected by his workers. See, Boaz apparently had no problem with shyness because in his first conversation with Ruth, he said, hey, let's do lunch. I mean, I, that's a modern translation, but that's what he said. I think his invitation and interest was a bit more than courtesy. Don't you? What's that song? Someone's in the kitchen with Dinah? Yeah. I don't get... The sense that Boaz was a confirmed bachelor either. He, I don't think he'd ruled out marriage. Quite, quite on the contrary, I think he was interested. His heart was open to the possibility, and it wouldn't surprise me to learn that he was actively praying that the Lord would provide him with a mate. And what we find here is a close encounter between the most eligible bachelor and the most eligible young widow in all of Bethlehem. And so by God's design, by his arrangement, the two came together and met. Did, did Boaz have any romantic interest in Ruth? I'll let you decide that. But I think this usually composed man was triply, tripping all over himself and whistling zippity doo da after that first meeting. Isn't love grand? From his own words in chapter 3 and verse 10, Boaz was probably no longer a young man. Time was passing him by and he was feeling the pains of loneliness. He, he was a man who had everything, that is everything, except for a wife and a family with whom he could share his life and his wealth. And at this stage of his life, nothing else may have seemed as important as Boaz finding a mate. And I would guess it was at least the fifth or the sixth inning for Boaz. Okay? Now, as a former AAA baseball player in the Yankee farm system, my dad had some homespun counsel for those who are single in the later innings and seeking a mate. He was known to say, listen, if you're down by one or two runs and it's your turn to bat, so what if the pitch is a little high and away? Take a cut at it. I, I heard him say that to this beautiful young woman in our church in her mid-30s who had never married. That was his counsel. I was pretty good. Take a cut at it. Well, this wasn't the case with Ruth. She was a perfect pitch. <laughs> and Boaz was interested in a most gentlemanly way. 
Now, in verses 18 to 22, Naomi enters the picture, and at the end of day one in the barley fields, Ruth returned to the place where she and Naomi were staying. That's verse 18. And would you notice it was in the city? Probably in a low-cost boarding house. And while Ruth enjoyed her lunch, she hadn't forgotten Naomi. She saved part of her lunch to bring back to her. That's verse 19. When she came home, Naomi was curious to know all about Ruth's day and how she had acquired so much barley. And as she looked with amazement at the sack of grain, she immediately recognized that Ruth had been unusually blessed. And she responded by blessing the one who had been so generous even before she knew his name. And then Ruth tells her, his name is Boaz. Now, in contemporary jargon, Naomi says in verse 20, wait, what? Did you say Boaz? Now, even in those days, there weren't too many men with the name Boaz, Boaz of Bethlehem. And so Naomi proceeded, listen closely to what I'm about to say to you, Ruth. This man is a relative of ours. In fact, he's a close relative of ours. He is a goel. He is a kinsman redeemer. He's a man who qualifies to redeem the wife of his deceased relative. Now, again, a paraphrase of verse 20 says, bless him. Or, or as they say in the South, bless his heart. But the thing to notice here is the fact that Naomi recognized that it was the Lord who had not withheld his kindness to Ruth. In chastening, God had been the source of her sorrow, chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. But now that God's chastening had been lifted, his dealings with her had turned again to kindness and blessing. Now, the fact that Naomi mentions the living and the dead provides us with a clue to her thoughts at that moment. The, the living obviously refers to herself and Ruth. God had not forgotten them. The dead refers to her dead husband and sons, the deceased husband of Ruth. The, the fact that God had brought Ruth into contact with the most eligible bachelor in Bethlehem who happened to be a relative, who happened to qualify to be a kinsman redeemer to Ruth, excites her with obvious possibility. I mean, this man, this man may be willing to redeem Ruth so as to keep the family name alive. And while Ruth scrambled to figure all this out, Naomi Listen, she heard wedding bells. In verse 21, Ruth then added some more good news. This is what Boaz said to me, he said, she said. Stay close to my workers until the harvest is ended. See, Boaz had given Ruth an open invitation to be in his fields every day for the next five or six weeks. And according to verse 22, by now, Naomi was so excited she couldn't contain herself. She was probably pinching herself to see if this was really happening, or, or was it a dream? Now, there could have been as many as 20 young women in Bethlehem with their eyes on Boaz. But, but God and Boaz had chosen to show favor to this, this one, Ruth. And so, in her excitement, Naomi blurts out, this is good. This is good. No, no, wait a minute. This is fantastic. Do, do whatever he tells you to do. Go with his female workers. Stay away from those other guys in the field who might do you harm. Well, in verse 23, we see how the relationship grows. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. For the next five or six weeks, Ruth did just what Naomi had recommended. During both the barley and the wheat harvests, she stayed close to the women who were employed by Boaz. But let's read between the lines just a little bit. I would imagine that Ruth and Boaz enjoyed conversation over lunch on a regular basis during those weeks of harvesting. See, this was a time of getting acquainted Perhaps a time for falling in love. You know, true love is built on something. It's built on discovery. It's built on knowledge. 
And when a couple's love stops growing, it's often because they have lost the thrill of discovery. Marriages thrive on the thrill of getting to know each other more and more intimately. And this is why it's so important to spend time with your mate, to communicate with your mate, so that communication and discovery can take place. And you know, the same principle applies to our love for God. Listen to this. To know the Lord is to love him. Amen? People who don't love God don't know him. They don't know him. And to know him better is to love him more. Amen? The Apostle Paul's primary ambition is set forth in Philippians 3.10 where he said that I may know him. And he wasn't talking about knowing Christ in terms of, of theology or head knowledge. The verb here to know is the Greek term epignosis or to know him in an intimate experiential way. And I would submit to you knowing Christ better is the secret to love. And then, thirdly, we find the role of a matchmaker. Chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you, that it may be well with you? Now Boaz, whose young women you were with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. And then it shall be when he lies down that you shall notice the place where he lies, and you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down, and he will tell you what you should do. And she said to her, All that you say to me, I will do. Now in these verses we find the, the intervention of Naomi. And, and I get the feeling that everyone sees sparks flying from Boaz except for Ruth. In all likelihood, she didn't see what was obvious because she was in survival mode. She wasn't looking for romance. She probably ruled out the option of remarriage because she was a Gentile and because of her need to care for her aging mother-in-law, Naomi. Whatever case, she needed a nudge. And so Naomi intervened as a proverbial matchmaker. You know, my record as a matchmaker is only 50%. Yeah, I, I have one great success and one horrific failure. I'll spare you the details about the failure and only tell you about my success. I like it better that way. In their mid-20s, Peter Plogman and Janice Buckholtz were both painfully, painfully shy. I think Peter plays the tuba because it's an instrument he can almost hide behind. Peggy and I were college career leaders at the church Peggy's dad pastored, and everybody in the church felt these two would make a great pair. The handwriting was on the wall. The only problem was the barrier caused by their personal insecurities and inhibitions. So we were, we were Christmas caroling with a college career group one evening when I noticed Peter sitting alone on the bus and Janice was also seated alone a few rows behind him. Well, after stopping at about five houses to sing, they continued to sit separately. So, so I intervened and I said to Peter, Peter, if you don't sit with Janice, she's going to die. And with serious resolve in his voice, Peter, serious guy that he was, said, well, pastor, we can't let her die. And so he moved up and sat with her. And you know, from that moment on, they were a couple. From that moment on, they were a couple. They just needed a nudge. And I have to say that Peter never really got over his nervousness because he passed out on the platform during their wedding ceremony and in a very unceremonious way. He rolled down five carpeted steps before he came to rest on the auditorium floor. How do I know this? I officiated that wedding. More music. Can we please have some more music? And smelling salts, too. We need smelling salts. Still today, 
They're happily married with a lovely home, three great children, and probably by now some grandchildren. Let me tell you, Peter fell for her in a big way, if you know what I mean. It would seem that neither Ruth nor Boaz suffered from shyness. But God used Naomi to nudge or to encourage Ruth. You know, for a woman to find a husband and a home was literally thought of as finding rest. Would you remember that word? It was literally finding rest. Manuka is the Hebrew term for rest. Would you remember that word? So right up front, Naomi states her interest in what she was about to recommend. Ruth, I'm recommending this for your security and so that it will be well with you. Now during verse 23, Naomi had obviously done some behind-the-scenes investigative work. She had learned that Boaz planned to win uh, a barley that very night. And she also knew that when Boaz worked the late shift, he often slept in the threshing area to protect his grain from thieves. You see, not every farmer in those days owned a threshing floor, so just as farmers do with combines today, the floor was rented or shared by many different farmers. And her instructions to Ruth were simple and they were direct. Now, I'm taking some liberties, but I think her instructions to Ruth can be stated this way. Wash up, spritz up, dress up, and shut up. That's basically what she said. You know, sometimes matchmakers have to be a little blunt. Now, verse 4, to our ears, Naomi's plan seems very, very unusual. But this approach was entirely proper in the culture of that day. And write it down, there was nothing, nothing immoral about Ruth's advance to Boaz. By uncovering the man's feet and lying down beneath his feet with his blanket covering her, Ruth was doing something. She was proposing marriage. By this ceremonial gesture, Boaz was encouraged to make a decision whether or not he was willing to redeem Ruth. Now let's hit the pause button to consider what this picture story represents. Would you remember that Boaz is a type or a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Redeemer? Ruth is a type of every Gentile who by nature is an alien to God's covenant without God, without his promises, without hope in this world. And Boaz is rich and he's self-sufficient But he's interested in something. He's interested in finding a bride. Ruth is poor. She's utterly dependent. Her only hope is that someone will reach out to her in mercy and grace. Now her heart has been turned to Jehovah, but she had so much to learn about the God of Israel. In utter simplicity, Ruth sought grace and help. And the Lord answered by directing her steps to Boaz. Now, in this picture, in this picture, we find a portrait of millions of Gentiles that God has led to faith in his son. In John 6 and verse 44, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, draws him. He also said, seek and you will find. When a person genuinely seeks the true way to God, you know what God does? He makes sure they find their way to the Lord Jesus. And so he draws them. Acts chapter 8, 26 to 39, tells the story of the conversion of one such Gentile. The Ethiopian treasurer was met by Philip as he traveled home. By the way, God... I would say raptured Philip and dropped him off exactly where that Ethiopian was. The Ethiopian had made the long journey from North Africa to Jerusalem to worship. He was a seeker. He was a proselyte uh, proselyte to Judaism who was earnestly seeking the true God, who he believed at that moment was the God of Israel. And as he read the Old Testament scriptures along that bumpy ride home, the Lord sent 
Philip, the evangelist, to direct him to Jesus Christ. And the Ethiopian went back to Africa that day, believing, baptized, and blessed. And his story paints a picture of sovereign grace as the Lord seeks to bring the lost to himself. And you know, I, I believe the same is true with many of us. As Gentiles, we were helpless, we were needy, we had no resources that commended us to God's favor, but in grace and mercy, God the Holy Spirit drew us to himself. In Christ, we found what we were searching for. And listen, we found much more than that, didn't we? But notice something else revealed by this picture story. Boaz showed Ruth favor before she committed herself to him. Immediately upon meeting her, Boaz took the initiative to show her kindness. He provided for her. He protected her. He showed her special favors and blessed her. Listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Before you ever knew Jesus, before you ever gave him the time of day, he loved you. He loved you. He had you in mind. And his heart longed to reach you. How do I know that? Because of the scripture verse we read this morning, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, why, would, why should anyone commit their life to Jesus Christ? Why should anyone trust Christ and join their life to his life? Why? Because he loves us. That's why. He loves us more than we will ever be loved. He loves us more than any other. He loves us more than we can grasp. In many ways, God has already demonstrated his love to every individual. Think of the many blessings we take for granted. You know, every good thing that has graced your life has come from God, whether you thanked him or not. And these gifts are tokens of love given to all mankind. The Bible says the Lord sends his rain on the just and the unjust. The Bible says God is good to all. But the greatest demonstration of his love is the fact that he gave his son to die for every one of us. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, there's one part of this picture story that we shouldn't overlook. It, it has to do with the role of Naomi. Uh, Naomi had been a witness to Ruth. And by her testimony, Ruth had come to know the God of Israel, the Father of our Savior. And can I say this to you? My friends, the world needs the pleasantness of Naomi's, because that's what her name means. Remember, it means pleasant. The world needs to see God in the lives of his people. The world needs to see people whose lives are different because God has saved them and made them new creations. The Ruths of the world also need the courageous encouragement of a Naomi. Remember, as a matchmaker, Naomi nudged Ruth in the direction of Boaz. She was sensitive to Ruth's needs. People like Naomi embrace the love of Christ and what it has to offer, but then they share Christ's love with those who know nothing about it. Naomi is a type of the believer who knows that Christ offers rest and wholeness. She, she knows the unique credentials of the Savior and senses his willingness to redeem the helpless. And you know the invitation is simply stated by Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you, say it with me, rest. Didn't I ask you to remember that word? I will give you manuka. Her encouragement to those who need Christ's love is this. Go to him. Go to him. Crawl under the safety of the blanket that covers his feet and do it without delay. 
And even so, God calls us who believe and are saved to be matchmakers, to direct and encourage needy people around us to come to Jesus Christ and find the rest their weary souls long for. Centuries before he came, this Old Testament picture reveals the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And would you listen? His love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And still today, there are many who need to place himself, themselves beneath his loving care. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together as we prepare for the Lord's table. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this beautiful picture story and what it teaches us about the longing of your heart to redeem us, to save us, to make us your own. And so as the bride of Christ, we give you thanks for what you've done already in our hearts and lives. You, by your spirit, have drawn us to yourself with cords of love. And we give you thanks for that. Now, bless us as we remember the, the meaning of the Lord's table and what these elements signify. For we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.